Today, we are pleased to have Sohail Faisi as our speaker. Sohail is an assistant professor at the University of Maryland College Park and has done a variety of interesting work on adversarial robustness, deep gender models, and network coding. He has received the best paper award over a three-year period from the IEEE Transactions on Network Science and Engineering for his work on network maximal correlation. Today, he'll tell us about his more recent work on generalizable adversarial robust robustness to unforeseen attacks. Please welcome Sohail Faisi. All right, thank you for the kind introduction and thanks everyone for virtually being here. So today I'm going to talk about generalizable adversarial robustness to unforeseen attacks. This is based on joint works with Alex Levin, Cassidy Laidlow, Sahil Singla, and Ankumar and Tom Goldstein. To make sure we are all on the same page, first I'll do a quick overview of adversarial robustness and attacks and defenses, and then I'll explain more recent results about them. So we say X prime is an adversarial example for a machine learning classifier. If that classifier uh, outputs different labels for X and X prime, while humans would classify X and X prime the same way. Probably you have seen different variations of this figure in different papers and talks. Here, or classifier correctly classifies X as an Egyptian cat, but if we adversarially perturb X to obtain an X prime, it will mislead classifier to uh, output a traffic light label while humans would classify X and X prime the same way. That's why we call X prime an adversarial example. So the key challenge here is that we don't have a good mathematical characterization of human perception, which is in fact very important, important in the definition of adversarial example. So I'll explain how currently we get around this problem and I'll propose a new approach to think about uh, tackling this challenge. All right, in the adversarial attack problem, we, uh, the goal is to create adversarial examples to mislead the classifier. And we use the following optimization. We are maximizing over X prime, a classification loss uh, at that point, given that X prime is within a particular threat model. So having this constraint that X prime lies in this particular threat model will ensure that humans would classify X and X prime the same way. So we'll get around that problem that we don't have a good mathematical characterization of the human perception. So this optimization often leads to non-convex optimization and we solve it approximately using projected gradient descent or other local search methods. Therefore, each attack is specified by the attack algorithm, the way that we solve this non-convex optimization problem and it is lost, as well as the threat model considered as the constraint in this optimization problem. So what are different attack uh, threat models that we have considered? So the most standard one is the LP threat model, where we assume the LP distance of X prime to X is within a particular uh, threshold of rho. And by choosing this rho, small enough will ensure that X prime has imperceptible changes with respect to X. The most commonly studied threat models are basically L1, L2, and L infinity, because in these cases, the constraint of the attack optimization uh, would be convex constraints, and that will be easier to deal with. Although understanding robustness against LP attacks uh, is very important and kind of necessary, but by no means it is sufficient to guarantee robustness of the model in practice because adversary can just use different uh, non-LP attacks that are often strong, strong attacks in practice in order to break the difference. So these non-LP attacks include sparse adversarial attacks where the attacker uh, change up to row pixels in the image in order to mislead the classifier. This can be Washington adversarial attack, which is a kind of a spatial transformation of the image in order to create an adversarial example. And we have recently introduced a functional adversarial attack where the adversarial perturbation is a function of input features. For instance, applying functional attacks in the color space we get an attack called recolor add that 
adversarially recolors the image in order to mislead the classifier. And you can see that combining these attacks, recolor attack, spatial attacks, and L infinity attack would lead to a very strong attack in practice. So this was like just the three minute overview of different attack methods. Now I'll do a quick review of defenses. So the most standard defense is based on adversarial training. In the standard ERM training, expectation risk minimization training, we are minimizing the average loss over the training set and we are picking model parameters theta to achieve that minimum. In adversarial training, instead, we are minimizing the average loss, not on the training set, but on the worst perturbations of training samples according to a particular threat model. For instance, here for LP attacks, we are assuming that the training samples will be perturbed adversarially within a particular LP bound, and we are going to minimize the average loss function over those perturbed samples in our training. So this is a mean max optimization problem. The outer minimization, again, we use a stochastic gradient descent, and the inner maximization is basically the attack problem that we often solve using projected gradient descent, and we alternate between the two. Again, similar to the attack, adversarial training is coupled with a specific attack algorithm to deal with the inner maximization problem, as well as the threat model that we consider for the adversarial perturbation. But there are many other heuristic defenses. Uh, for instance, in ICLR 2018, six, seven different defenses were proposed on different data sets and ag against different threat models. All right, so when we have these defenses, the attacker, the adversary, wants to break these defenses. So if the adversary is nice enough, it will say, okay, I'm going to use the same threat model that the defense uh, was using. I'm going to have a fixed threat model, but I'm going to come up with a stronger algorithm to break the defense. This is like quote unquote a nice adversary. So for example, all of these defenses that were proposed in ICLR 2018, they were broken in a paper in ICML 2019, except the defense scan work, which subsequently was broken uh, in another paper. So this kind of shows that these empirical defenses are vulnerable against adaptive strong attacks, even within the same threat model. Here I'm assuming the adversary is quote unquote nice enough to use exactly the same threat model. But in practice, uh, of course, adversary by definition uh, is not nice, so it can use a different threat model that was used during the defense in order to break the defense. And that leads us to understand generalization of these defenses to unforeseen attacks. In these cases, attackers may not, and in, you know, in practice will not obey the threat model used in the defense. And previously it has been shown that standard defenses, they often have poor generalization to unforeseen attacks. So first we tested unforeseen attack robustness of different adversarially trained models and defenses on CIFAR-10. Here are some results. The rows, they show models that are adversarially trained against L-infinity, L2, against spatial transformations, and against recolor add. And columns, they show different attacks that we evaluate these defenses against. If you look at the diagonal of this table, uh, this shows adversarial, adversarial training against a particular uh, threat model is in fact quite effective to defend against that uh, type of attack. For example, adversarial training against L-infinity would give a 52% uh, robustness against L-infinity attack. Same for adversarial training against L2 uh, would give roughly speaking 50% against L2 attacks and so on and so forth. But what about off-diagonal terms? Let's look at the first row. This is the model that is adversarially trained against L-infinity attack. 
But you can see against L2, the performance is reduced significantly compared to its performance against L infinity. Against a special transformation, it is even worse. The performance is below 10%. The same phenomena happens when you look at adversarial train models against L2, special transformations, and recolor app. In other words, these defenses, they show poor generalization against unforeseen attacks. These are the attacks that they were not used in training. And this is basically the ultimate goal of robustness because adversary won't obey the threat model used in the defense. All right. So with this introduction, in today's talk, in the first part, I'll consider attacks and defenses within a particular threat model. So the threat model will be fixed. And in the second part, I'll show some uh, results about generalization of robustness to unforeseen attacks, when the threat model can actually be different than the model that we have trained our networks against. So I'll pause here. Uh, perhaps I can uh, read some of the questions. Uh, sure. Um, so we have one comment. Sorry. So we have one comment from Kamyar as is at Nashley. Um, so he he pointed out the implementation for Dylan and all was incorrect for some reason, and the attack did not break. So I was wondering if you have any comments on that. Uh, so I'm not sure about the specific uh, uh, paper that uh, Kamyar is referring. Maybe we can talk about it offline, but in general, these defenses, these heuristic defenses, uh, they can be broken even if a particular uh, attack is not uh, effective. There are some other adapt adaptive attacks in order to break these uh, uh, defenses. So there is another question. What is uh, ST add? It is a spatial uh, transformation of the image in order to craft an adversarial example. Right, and we also have a question from Sanjeev. Uh, what happens if you do um, AT with several attacks at once? Um, does the previous table change in that case? That's a very good question. So if you do adversarial training against multiple attacks, it increases the robustness against those attacks that they were trained, but then the generalization is really poor. So the clean accuracy, and also accuracy with respect to other attacks, it drops significantly. So we are also doing some of these experiments to look at the combination of uh, threat models during adversarial training. Okay, and we also have another clarification requested by Varun Chatran Sekaran. Um, so the question is, what does, do you mean by heuristic defenses? Do you have a definition for it? Uh, yes, so I think in part one it will uh, be clear. By heuristic defenses, we mean defenses that they do not come with a particular guarantee of robustness. I think in part one it will, uh, you know, be clear the definition of heuristic versus provable defenses. All right. Okay, uh, good. So let's uh, start with part one. So here, uh, we'll be focusing on provable or certifiable defenses. We say a classifier is certifiably robust at the point X if for any X prime within that threat model. Again, remember, here I'm assuming the threat model is given and is fixed. If for any X prime within that threat model, we have the output of classifier the same for X and X prime. And this is shown in this picture, uh, and rho is called the certified robustness or certification level. All right, in the last uh, couple of years, there have been a lot of interesting works about certifiable defenses and provable defenses. So here I'm going to attempt to provide a big picture of the current uh, literature and current pro provable defenses and uh, then talk about some of the details of them. All right, so these methods, they may use different levels of information, different amount of information from the network architecture in the defense. Some of these methods, they only use input-output relationship. 
Some of them, they may use some more information from the network, for example, the gradient. Some of them, they may use some higher order information from the networks. All right, against LP attacks, we have roughly speaking these provable defenses. One family of provable defenses is based on randomized smoothing. These are the most scalable defenses against LP attacks and it can you know, be used even on very large and deep networks. But the thrust back is that randomized smoothing, they mostly use input output relationship from the network without going into the details of the network architecture and getting information from, uh, from the architecture and the parameters. Other families uh, include interval bound propagation or some convex relaxations. And recently in an ICML paper, uh, we introduce a curvature based certificate that uses second order information uh, from the network in order to uh, have a provable defense. A rule of thumb, when your defense uses more information from the network, it is performing well on small networks, but it is not scalable to very large and deep networks. While randomized smoothing, even though it may not be as good on small networks, but it is scalable to large and deep networks. All right, but also we have some interesting results about provable defenses against non-LP attacks, such as sparse attacks, Washenstein attacks, and patch attacks. All right, so in the first part, I'll mainly focus on randomized smoothing based methods against LP attacks. I'll be happy to talk about other uh, defenses, especially non-LP defenses offline if you're interested. All right, so what is randomized smoothing? So we say a smooth classifier is defined as the following. F is my base classifier, and I'm going to add some noise to it as input, and I'm going to take the average of my output over the noise distribution that I consider for smoothing. Here, I'm assuming the noise distribution is according to a Gaussian distribution with zero mean and sigma square identity covariance. This is my smooth classifier. So if your base classifier f of x is something like this, it may have some sharp edges in its decision boundary. And in, because of these edges, uh, when you have x, it may be adversarially sensitive. And I can have a small perturbation to change the label of x by perturbing it to the blue side from the green side. But in small thing, I'm going to add some Gaussian noise to x, and I'm going to look at the average of my output and hopefully that averaging out will smooth out some of these sharp edges in my classification boundary and I will increase the intrinsic robustness of my classifier. So Gaussian smoothing for L2 attacks uh, has been used in Cohen ETL work and they have this really nice result about the robustness certificate that Gaussian smoothing would provide against L2 attacks. They say no adversarial example would exist within this radius. Sigma is the uh, variance of the smoothing noise distribution. Phi inverse is the inverse of the standard normal uh, distribution. P1 is the majority class probability and P2 is the runner-up class probability. Okay, look at this certification radius. The only thing I use from the network is this P1 and P2. Basically, I have my X, I add a bunch of uh, noise realizations to it, and I see what is the fraction of uh, perturbations that I have the majority class, and what is the fraction of uh, perturbations that my network uh, produces the label of the runner-up class. And that's the only information I use from the network. That's why I had in that first slide that the smoothing-based methods, they don't use the specific uh, architecture and the specific connectivity of the neurons in the architecture in order to come up with the certification uh, against adversarial examples. 
All right, so the proof of this result in Cohen ETL work is based on Neyman Pearson's lemma in 1933. And one comment is that this P1 and P2, they are computed over a Gaussian distribution, but we cannot compute them exactly because of computing an integral in very high dimensional space of a neural network would be really expensive. Uh, so instead we do computation of these bounds empirically using empirical distribution. And then this theorem would hold with high probability for sufficiently large number of smoothing perturbations. So another view to this result is something that uh, with uh, Alex and Sahil, uh, at the same time uh, with, uh, in another paper, Salman Etial, with a different proof uh, was provided. And that view is the following, that when you are doing Gaussian smoothing, phi inverse of F bar, F bar is your smooth function. Phi inverse of F bar is just a Lipschitz function with a constant one over sigma, where sigma is the variance of the smoothing. This is a real simple explanation that why smoothing increases the robustness because in fact, phi inverse of phi bar is a Lipschitz function and straightforwardly you can show that that will give us this robustness guarantee. So just to warm up, I'm going to even provide the simpler proof, a one dimensional proof for Gaussian smoothing that uh, potentially can be taught in, uh, in high school as well. So I'll uh, do that for a warm up. So this is a simple proof for Gaussian smoothing uh, by Alex Levin and myself. So here we have X or input, and we want to see if we are robust against X prime, that is rho away from or input X. Because Gaussian is spherically symmetric, without loss of generality, I can put my X at the origin, and I can put my X prime along the first axis. Then I'm going to smooth out D minus one other dimensions and define just the scalar function from R to R. This G is going to be just the function, a scalar function that we have. And by definition, G bar would be the smooth version of G. So it is very easy to show that the only thing we need to show is phi inverse of G bar is Lipschitz with a constant one over sigma. And why is that the case? What is the worst G that will give me the highest Lipschitz constant for phi inverse uh, of G bar. I can pick a G something like this. If I do a smoothing of this function, I'll get a smooth function like this. Remember, the only constraint that we have is that G bar at origin, which is our clean image, should be a fixed number. Here it is uh, G bar of zero is 0 0.691. And then if I look at phi inverse of G bar, I'll get a function like this, which is in fact a Lipschitz function. But is this the worst G that will give me the highest Lipschitz constant of phi inverse of G bar? What if I pick a step function? In that case, if I do a smoothing, the G bar would look like something like this. Again, the constraint that I have is G bar of zero is equal to that particular number obtained from the training. But if you look at this function, this is the reverse Gaussian CDF. So if I do a composition of phi inverse with this function, I'll just get a straight line with a slope of mi minus one over sigma. And in fact, this is the worst function of G that will give me the highest Lipschitz constants of phi inverse of G bar. So that's just like some uh, picture to build some intuition, but uh, it is a one dimensional calculus that you can show. You can define G phi of y with this change of variable and using a straightforward one dimensional calculus, you can show that G bar of rho is greater than this integral from zero to one, G phi of y times this function dy. The constraint that we have is the integral of G phi of y is equal to G bar of zero. This is the constant that we have from the training. 
And since this is monotonically increasing, that will lead the worst G, G phi and the worst G function is in fact a step function. You plug this in into the equation, you immediately get the worst Lipschitz constant of phi inverse of G bar to be equal to one over sigma. All right, so randomized smoothing uh, have been used for other uh, yeah, different types of attacks. For L2 attacks, we know we use Gaussian smoothing. And there is like a good coupling between Gaussian and L2 uh, attacks. And for L1 attacks, people, they uh, use log loss noise in order to have a provable defense. But the question is, what are proper smoothing distributions against LP attacks? What if I use L4 attack or L infinity attack? What kind of smoothing distributions I should use to have a good robust certificate against that attack? So in order to address that, we need to understand generalizability of randomized smoothing against different LP attacks. So we have the following result. For that, this is a paper that uh, is presented in ICML 2020. So we show that using any symmetric IID smoothing distribution, we have this upper bound on the robustness radius against LP attacks. This upper bound depends on sigma, uh, which is the smoothing uh, variance. Uh, P1 and P2 defined similarly as before. This is the fraction of the top class and the runner-up class. But more importantly, we have an extra dependence on dimension that we did not have in the Gaussian case. For P greater than two, we see this upper bound in fact depends on D. And that's why we observe this curse of dimensionality for P greater than two, if my dimension increases, this upper bound on any robustness radius against LP attacks within symmetric IID smoothing distributions would decrease to zero. Okay, so we have a few questions. Um, uh, so okay, so I'll pause here to take these questions. Yes, um, so the first question is from Avri Ma. Um, the question is, what's the intuition behind the poor scalability when using more information of the network? Uh, right, so, you know, in gradient-based or curvature-based methods, uh, the main um, basically intuition is to increase the Lipschitzness of the network or Lipschitzness of the gradient of the network, which would be the curvature. But these bounds often are not good, especially for deep networks, because the way that, roughly speaking, we compute these bounds is by multiplying some Lipschitz constants layer-wise, and that leads to an explosion of these bonds for deeper networks. Uh, there may be the case that in the future that we may come up with better ways to compute Lipschitz constants of the network itself or the gradient of the network, and that's a very interesting area of research to see if we can scale up those gradient-based or curvature-based certifications uh, to deeper networks. Mm -hmm. Um, the, uh, the following question is from Rohit Goswami. Um, the question is, is the proof you presented earlier specific to deterministic classifiers as opposed to randomized classifiers? Right, so here we assume F is a deterministic classifier. F bar would be a randomized classifier. Okay. And the next question is from Sanjeev. Um, so um, I guess, um, you know, just, I guess a broad question. Um, so we earlier talked about uh, generalized defenses against many kinds of attacks, um, but the, just for clarity, is this uh, you know, uh, defense that you just presented, the smoothing defense that's only um, valid for L2 perturbations? Uh, that's a very good point. So. The first part, I'm going to talk about smoothing methods against various LP attacks. And I'll show like what happens if you use like just Gaussian smoothing against maybe L4 attack or L infinity attack. But we are going to be constrained within LP attack. In the second part of the talk, I'll actually propose a different view to this problem to see if we can boost the generalizability to 
even non-LP attacks or other various types of attacks. So that will be the main focus in the second part of the talk uh, that hopefully will be there in like 15 minutes. But <clears throat> this Sanjeev, so you're still going to always use smoothing attacks with the Gaussian norms. Uh, for and this is all classical that, you know, for LP, Eff efficacy will decrease uh, exactly what you say there in the theorem that's classical. Right, so in the first part, yeah, we'll focus on the smoothing, but in the second part, I'll introduce a new defense that is okay. not based on smoothing. Okay, thanks. Okay, and finally, is there any relationship between the result you presented here and the, um, the classic paper by Piotr Indyk on uh, dimension reduction for LP? Uh, no, sorry, that was a comment to the audience that I thought that's where he would go. Okay. That, you know, there's a connection between this Gaussian noise and dimension reduction, and then Indic has some classic ideas for LP. I'm not sure if that's where he's going. Okay. All right, so that's all the questions. Uh, please go ahead. Sounds good. Um, uh, okay, so this was the result that we have for any symmetric IID smoothing. So what if you restrict your class of smoothing a little bit. What if you look at generalized Gaussian in this form that your uh, distribution uh, depends on also a shape parameter. Generalized Gaussian when Q is equal to two is basically going to be a Gaussian distribution. When Q is equal to one, it is a Laplace distribution, but you have this freedom to choose the shape of the, uh, shape of the distribution with Q. So for that, we have also this result that using general, generalized Gaussian smoothing, we have an upper bound on the robustness radius against any LP attacks. Again, we have sigma, which is the smoothing variance. Uh, we have the same dependence on the dimension for P greater than two. But interestingly, this upper bound, it does not depend on the shape parameter Q. And we'll see, in fact, if the shape of the distribution would actually matter in the robustness certificate at all. So another approach is forget about everything and just use Gaussian smoothing for LP attacks. I can have a bound LP, I can surround my LP ball with a larger L2 ball and extend the Gaussian certificate to have a robustness against any LP attacks using this formula. And this is the upper bound that I presented in uh, the previous slide for any symmetric IID smoothing. Just look at these two formulas. The dependence on sigma and D is basically, roughly speaking, the same for using Gaussian smoothing or any other symmetric IID smoothing. Yes, the constants that they depend on P1 and P2, they can be different, I'll talk about it, but the dependence on sigma and D, roughly speaking, the same. So in other words, up to some constants, Gaussian smoothing is in fact optimal within the family of IID smoothing distributions against LP attacks. So you don't need to worry too much about you know, the shape of your smoothing distribution uh, if you have L4 or L5 attack. You can just use Gaussian. You may lose a constant factor, but in terms of the dependence on sigma and the dimension, it will be optimal for you. So we have some results against uh, uniform L-infinity and L1 smoothing. Uh, with uniform L-infinity smoothing, you get this bound. With uniform L1 smoothing, you'll get this bound. They have a stronger dependence on the dimension D. I won't go into the details of them. Uh, but if you are interested in uh, smoothing with different shapes, there's a recent and interesting paper that talks about uh, different uh, smoothing shapes. I'll encourage you to take a look at this paper as well. All right, so again, in IID smoothing, we have this upper bound. In generalized Gaussian, we have this upper bound. In terms of the sigma and D, they're basically, roughly speaking, the same. However, we have a dependence on P1. When P1 goes to one, these bonds will go to infinity. Maybe I can come up with the shape of a smoothing distribution. Okay, so the dependence on sigma and D would be the same but maybe I can have a large P1 for one particular shape of the distribution, and that would basically give me a good robustness compared to other distributions. 
So we did some experiments to look into that effect. We looked into C4 with different resolutions, with these different smoothing uh, variances, and with different shapes of the distribution. This Q is the shape parameter. And as you can see, this P1, roughly speaking, stays this, the same across different smoothing distributions. So the shape of the distribution does not strongly affect P1 of X. That kind of means that coupled with our the theoretical result, the robustness radius would be roughly speaking the same, even if you use different smoothing uh, shapes in your experiments. And that's what we observe empirically. So this is on C power 10. Uh, the yellow one is the Gaussian certificate. This is a lower bound. And the green uh, curve is the generalized Gaussian. This is an upper bound. And the blue curve is the IID smoothing upper bound. For larger variance, and we use P is equal to Q in the generalized Gaussian smoothing bounds. For larger variance, we see the, uh, in fact, IID smoothing bound is tighter than the generalized smoothing bound. But if you look at the ratios of generalized smoothing, uh, generalized Gaussian smoothing to the lower bound of Gaussian certificate, it is roughly speaking a constant factor across different shapes. That does mean that we don't see a significant gain of tweaking the shape of the distribution uh, to obtain a higher certification radius that we have. So finally, we also looked into experiments between C410 and ImageNet. So here C410 has a smaller dimension compared to the ImageNet uh, or theory suggests that the certification level would decrease by an order of d to the power half minus one over p when we go from c part 10 to ImageNet. And roughly speaking, we observe those behaviors uh, for p2, p4, and p infinity. All right, so for the interest of the time, I'm going to actually skip this proof. If you are interested, take a look at the paper or um, contact me uh, to discuss it. Actually, uh, before we move on, um, so we have a question from Sanjeev. Um, and the, uh, so the question is, is there any connection between this work and the classic work on uh, uh, P-stable um, Euclidean LSH, so locally sensitive fashion? Oh, it's very interesting, actually. Um, I know about that work. Um, so, I'm not sure if there is a like direct connection. I don't see it, but uh, I haven't thought about it. Uh, it's a very interesting question. Uh, do you see a connection, uh, Sanjeev? Uh, you know, they were trying to do things like dimension reduction and right. hashing and so on. Um, yeah, I, 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 can't, I don't know off the top of my head, you know, if it yeah. can be extended to two little things. Very interesting. Awesome. So, yeah, uh, I'll think about it. It's a very good comment. All right. So uh, then uh, I'll go to the next part, uh, which in this part, as I you know, mentioned in the beginning, adversaries, they won't, you know, in practice, follow your threat model. And here we are going to look at defenses that they, uh, that the, the defenses that they have a good generalization to unforeseen attacks with different threat models. All right, so this is a, uh, the paper uh, is uh, brand new. So we posted an archive last night. So it will uh, hopefully appear uh, tonight or tomorrow. So take a look at the draft. All right, so in order to tackle this problem, we need to first understand the relationship between different threat models. Right, so this big box represents unrestricted threat model. These are the set of X primes where humans would classify X and X prime the same way. And if our model misclassifies X prime, then it would be an adversarial exam. Within this big uh, unrestricted threat model, there is a subset that we call true perceptual threat model. These are the X prime that the true perceptual distance between X and X prime is less than a threshold that makes the changes in X prime imperceptible with respect to X. 
right? So most of the research in adversarial robustness is focused on this threat model uh, to defend against imperceptible adversarial changes. But the problem is that we don't have a good mathematical characterization of this set. So the way that the current approaches uh, work is something that I call a bottom-up approach. So we try to fill in this threat model using a smaller threat models. For example, LP threat model would be a subset of these true perceptual threat models. We can have special uh, threat models, so on and so forth. Some threat models like patch attacks, they may actually go outside of this uh, perceptual threat model because these patches may be uh, noticeable changes to the image. All right, so in this part, I'm going to propose a different approach. I'm going to propose a top-down approach to tackle this problem. Instead of filling in this uh, percept true perceptual threat model, we will try to approximate this whole true perceptual threat model using neural perceptual threat models. So I don't know the true perceptual distance between X and X prime, but if I can come up with a neural network that approximates this true perceptual distance, then I can have an approximation of this true perceptual threat model using a neural perceptual threat model. This is the key idea that we have in this part. All right, in the neural perceptual threat model, we are going to use deep networks in order to approximate the true perceptual distance in the adversarial threat model. But it is not so easy. So we'll have several challenges that I'll uh, deal one by one in this part. The first challenge is what are the proper neural perceptual distance functions that I can use to approximate human perception, true human perception. The second challenge would be my attack is going to be a much more complex problem because now my constraints, instead of being a nice convex set, they're going to be a very complex constraint depending on this neural perceptual distance. And the third challenge would be in the defense we'll have a new front of vulnerability because this threat model by itself depends on the neural network and can be vulnerable against attacks. So how we can deal with these problems? All right, so for the first challenge, we are going to see what kind of neural perceptual distance functions we can use. This is an age old problem in computer vision. In fact, there are several previous works that they look at surrogate functions to approximate human perception, uh, such as SSIM or LPIPS distances. So in this part, we are going to use LPIPS distance, which stands for learned perceptual image patch similarity as or neural perceptual distance between X and X prime. But other functions, if they are better in quality, can also be used in our framework as well. So in the LPIPS distance, we consider an L-layer convolutional classifier G from images to the labels, where channel normalized internal activations of layer I is shown by GI of X. We, did, we then define a feature map phi of X by again renormalizing these GI of X using the width and the height of the convolutional filter in that layer. The neural perceptual distance between X and X prime is then defined as the norm of the difference between phi of X and phi of X prime. And this phi is defined using that uh, network G. How can I use this in order to formulate perceptual adversarial attacks? This will be our attack optimization. We are going to pick uh, we are going to maximize over X prime a classification loss subject to this constraint that the neural perceptual distance between X and X prime, which is phi of X minus phi of X prime is less or equal to rho. The objective is again, similar to LP attacks is a non-convex objective. 
But the difference here is that the constraint is also a non-convex constraint. All right, so one uh, thing that we have here, what is G? F is my classifier, but G is the network that I use for computing these phi uh, to define my neural perceptual distances. The attacker can use, in fact, the same perceptual network as the classification network. F can be equal to G, and in that case, we call it self-bounded attack. Or the attacker can use a different network for perceptual and classification networks. F can be a different function than G. And in that case, we call it externally bounded attack. So I'll show results for both of these attacks. So within this attack framework, we develop two specific attack algorithms. One we call PPGD, stands for Perceptual Projected Gradient Descent. PPGD attack is very similar in spirit to PGD attack, and it has two steps. In the first step, we solve the first order approximation of the attack optimization problem. And in the second step, we project back the, 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 the X prime onto the feasible set of the optimization. So we have this following lemma that shows the first order optimal adversarial perturbation under the perceptual threat model can be computed using these updates where J is the Jacobian of my feature map with respect to X and F hat is the composition of the classification loss and my network F. But in practice, we have an efficient computation of these updates using conjugate gradient methods because we don't wanna solve this inverse, uh, inverse of this matrix at every step. That would be expensive. And for the projection, we use an approximate projection using a method called bisection root finding uh, method. Uh, I won't go into the details of it, but if you're interested, I can talk about it offline. So the second attack that we develop is called LPA, Lagrangian perceptual attacks. So in the LPA optimization, I'm going to introduce my perceptual constraint with a Lagrangian weight and a hinge loss in my objective function. So if my perceptual distance is less than rho, I don't have any additional penalty, but if it is above rho, it will penalize those uh, X primes uh, linearly based on the amount of the violation of this perceptual constraint. So in spirit, this is similar to Carlini and Wagner attack for LP uh, threat models. And similar to Carlini and Wegener attack, we do a search on the Lagrangian weight. We start with a small value of lambda. And if the solution is outside of the desired perceptual distance, we increase lambda. So I'll show results, but I wanna highlight here, LPA is the strongest adversarial attack against various types of even adversarially trained based models. It's a really, really strong attack. All right, so let's look at some examples in order to gain a little bit of an intuition about these attacks. Let's look at some examples first by LPA self-bounded. All right, so here I have an original image. This is my clean sample, and this is my adversarially perturbed sample using LPA self, and this is the magnified difference between original and adversarial sample. And as you can see, the adversarial attack kind of cleverly changes the lighting of this part of the image. And also if you take a look in terms of the strings that we have in this jewelry, it appears that the type of this string, strings have been changed in order to create an adversarial example. Again, we are not doing any of these fine tuning to say, oh, I wanna change the brightness or lightening. So this is, happening automatically within the attack. Some more examples. Let's look at this figure. In the adversarial version of this, the background of this image is changed in order to mislead the classifier. 
Here we have slight spatial transformation of the objects in the image. And interestingly, if you look at this sock image, uh, the uh, snowman here, if you look at the texture of this, it appears the texture is slightly changed in order to mislead the classifier. Again, these are the perturbations that are, uh, that our attack tries to still be imperceptible to human eyes, but to mislead the classifier at the same time. So let's look at some more example attacks with different attack methods that we have. Original examples, this is PPG, the attack self-bounded with AlexNet and LPA self-bounded with AlexNet. So let's look at this example. Let's look at this, uh, I think it's a tiger and look at the eyes of this tiger and look at the adversarial perturbation of it. So the color of the eyes are different in order to mislead the classifier, but it is different in a way that <laughs> Perceptible, imperceptible changes. So it is not an obvious change in the image. Similar for this, uh, the uh, side mirror of a car, we have some changes in the boundary of this. It's kind of, you know, a special change in those parts. We have some changes in the brightness and so on and so forth in these attacks. Again, we are not fine tuning these types of perturbations. So this is the neural perceptual distance that does the job for us. All right, so now we can use this threat model to have an adversarial training against perceptual distance that we have. That's what we call PAT, perceptual adversarial training. This is the PAT optimization. It is very similar to the uh, adversarial train optimization. But instead of maximizing X prime over, for instance, an LP thread model, we are going to maximize X prime over the neural perceptual distance to uh, bound it is perceptuality with respect to X. Again, we'll have two versions of PAT, self-bounded PAT where perceptual and classification networks are the same, F is equal to G. And the neural perceptual distance here would change during the training because I'm updating my classifier F that would update my G because F is equal to G and my perceptual distance definition would also change during the training. And the other version of PAT is externally bounded PAT when the neural perceptual network is pre-trained. So we solve the inner maximization using a fast variance of LPA when we don't do the search over the Lagrangian weight. The reason is that, that the, the search is very expensive and this inner maximization should be solved repeatedly during the optimization in order to have a robust model. All right, but everything that I described here, uh, maybe I can pause here and take some questions, okay? Right, so we have one question from Varun. Um, so uh, the question is, how are perceptual changes different from semantic changes? For example, reducing the brightness of the eyes of the cheetah can be considered a change in the semantics of the endpoints. That's a good point. So uh, there are in fact some uh, works that they look at some semantic changes or changes in the latent representations of these images. Uh, we, as I mentioned, we have a attack based on recoloring or changing the brightness of the image. But here, we are not fine tuning against any of them. So here, the attack is going to be within this neural perceptual distance. And our intention is that this is a large enough class of adversarial examples that if we have a robustness against this type of thread model, it would generalize to have robustness against other types of threat models. Uh, in contrast that if we just focus on a particular threat model, then it may not generalize well to other types of threat models. So, sorry, just a follow-up question. So you're saying perceptual distance kind of subsumes like semantic transformations and P norms and so on? Yes. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, um, and I also happen to have another question. So in the setting when f is equal to g, um, so um, I suppose, I mean, f is a classifier that maps your input to a class label, right? Um, yes. So g has to map the input to, I suppose, a, a real number, right, in, the, in your case. Right, because so uh, basically, uh, if you remember the definition, g is the network that we use, and when we look at different internal representations of g, and then obtain this feature maps. And I can use the same for network F and G, uh, and I can use a different network as well. Does right. that make sense? But okay, so but in the case when F is equal to G, what do you mean precisely there? Um, I mean, does G have also mapped to a class label? Right, so G exactly maps to the same number of classes at the end of the day, but I'm going to use the internal representations in order to define my feature map. Okay, sure. Thank you. All right. So the whole thing is basically depends on how good this neural perceptual distance and this neural perceptual thread model approximates the true perceptual distance and the true perceptual thread model. And we have no way of mathematically characterizing it without having human evaluation. And that's why we do human evaluations on Amazon Mechanical Turk AMT to study the approximation power of this neural perceptual distances. Here's our pipeline. So we are going to create adversarial examples using different attacks on ImageNet 100. So this is a subset of ImageNet uh, samples. These will be X and X primes. We consider 12 different threat models plus PPGD and LPA attacks, and for each model, we have three bonds, small, medium, and large perturbations that will give us, uh, roughly speaking, 37,000 annotations for more than 7,000 image pairs. We will show each image pair for two seconds for, a, for an AMT participant, and we'll ask if this pair, which one is real? the perceptuality of the attack would be the proportion of pairs for which participants are correct. If the attack is really imperceptible, the participants would just randomly guess and the perceptuality would be just 50%, the worst. But if the attack is really obvious in terms of the perceptual changes, then the participants would be 100% correct and the perceptuality of the attack uh, would be 100%. All right, so let's do this uh, experiment. Uh, so here I'm gonna show you six images. Uh, this is basically the pipeline that we have on AMT. Uh, for each pair, we pay one cent for just the participation and an additional cent for a correct answer. Obviously I won't pay you uh, if you answer during this talk. Uh, I'll show you six images. Uh, and see if you can uh, guess which image is real and which image has adversarial perturbations in it. All right, are you ready? One, two, three. All right, so this is the pipeline we have. The first image, continue. So which one is real? Right. This one is left, this is kind of obvious. The right one is real. Again, this is obvious. The left one is real. This is a bit more tricky, but the right one is real. This is again, a bit more tricky. Probably the right one is real. So this is basically the experience that an AMT participant has. And then we collect all of this data in order to understand the perceptibility of the attacks. All right, so here is the attack perceptibility versus the neural perceptual distance that we use. As I mentioned, we consider 12 different types of attacks with PPGD and LPA and three bounds each for each attack. So the x-axis shows the mean LPIPS distance and the y-axis shows the perceptibility of that attack. And as you can say, okay, it is not 100% correlated, but the attack perceptibility is in fact correlates pretty well with the neural perceptual distance that we use in all defenses. So that kind of you know, implies, if you remember those uh, circles that I showed in terms of the true perceptual distance, 
and the neural perceptual distance, this is in fact a pretty good approximation. Now let's look at some results on CIFAR-10. We use the uh, standard bonds against L infinity, L2, and other attacks. And here are the results. The, the rows they show adversarially trained models against L infinity, L2, a special recaller app, and perceptual adversarially trained model using self-bounded AlexNet, ResNet 50, and ResNet 50 that is adversarially trained with L2. All right, so let's look at, uh, for example, the path self-bounded and adversarially trained model with respect to L infinity. Okay, against L infinity, the model that is specifically robustified, robustified against L infinity shows a better performance that, than PAT with 10% improvement uh, with respect to L infinity. But if you look at L2, PAT achieves more than 20% higher robustness Against a spatial transformation, it achieves more than 40%, 45% robustness. Against recolor ad, it achieves more than 15% robustness, and so on and so forth. So I also want to highlight the strengths of this LPA attack that we have developed here. It is a really, really strong attack. And none of these adversarially trained models, they can defend against LPA uh, in a reliable fashion. So in this case, we see that PAT has a pretty high unforcing attacks, attack robustness on C410. It has a very good generalization to the attacks that it hasn't been trained on. So next we experimented on ImageNet 100. So here's a bigger table. We look at again, uh, more than 12 types of attacks. And these are the methods, adversarially trained methods against these uh, attacks. So one caveat here I want to mention, here we are using pre-trained adversarial uh, trained models uh, for LP from this paper. Uh, we are rerunning some of these networks just to make sure that every hyperparameter that is being used is the same. But here are the current results that we have. Again, same as before, let's compare adversarial train against L infinity and PAT self-bounded. Against L infinity, we are 3, 4% lower, but against L2, we are 40% higher. Against L1, we have, again, 40% higher performance. These are JPEG attacks, same thing against snow attack, against elastic attack, spatial transformation, recolor at, so on and so forth, we have a significant improvement in terms of the generalization of the robustness to unseen attacks. And same as before, LPA is a really strong attack. So all of these methods, they uh, are broken using this LPA attack. So this implies that path, path on ImageNet 100 also has high unforeseen attack for robustness. So that will conclude uh, my talk. So in the first part, we uh, looked into limits of provable defenses, and we saw curse of dimensionality when we use IID smoothing-based <clears throat> provable defenses. But we are not hopeless. Maybe there are some non-IID smoothing distributions that can achieve better certificates. Or uh, as Sanjeev also mentioned, maybe there are some low intrinsic dimensionality uh, of images that can be leveraged in order to beat or mitigate this curse of dimensionality that we have here. So in the second part, I talked about generalizable defenses to unforeseen attacks. I introduced neural perceptual threat model, which is an approximation to the true perceptual threat model using neural networks. Uh, we introduced two types of attacks and one defense called PAT, which is generalizable to unforeseen attack. And in the second part, this path doesn't come with a robustness guarantee. So an interesting question would be to see if we can come up with provable defenses against such perceptual threat models as well. So that's it, and I'll be happy to take more questions. All right, let's thank Sohail for the great talk. Um, so we do have a few questions. Um, the first question is from Varun. Um, who asked, uh, what's the significance of the time limiting in the AMT experiments? 
uh, two seconds. So there was another study uh, that they use roughly speaking the same uh, time. So we thought about increasing this time, the two seconds that we show these images. But if you show it like for a longer period of time, then the, the, the measure that we'll observe may not represent the true perceptuality of that hack. So that's why we stick to the two second uh, limit of showing these images to the participants. Okay. Um, so we have another question from Abhishek Panigrahi. Um, and the question is in the experiment results, uh, it seems that L infinity distance uh, is correlating well with perceptual distance, at least better than L1 or L2 distance. Is there some reason behind that? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, we see some uh, maybe higher or lower correlations. I wouldn't read too much into it because we have only three bounds, uh, small, medium, and large. And uh, that's why we show like the, all of these results at the same time in order to have a you know, more statistically significant uh, inference about the correlation between the perceptual distance and the LPIPS. In order to understand, for instance, L infinity would have a better correlation with perceptual distance, we may try you know, many more bounds in order to have a statistically significant uh, inference in that case. So I wouldn't read too much into these specific threat models. Right. Um, we have one question from Shirayas Kolkarni, um, who asked for two inputs, X and X prime, does a low perceptual distance between them ex explicitly imply um, that they're drawn from the same distribution, um, same training distribution used by the neural network. Right, so that's the hope, right? So if X and X prime, they have low perceptual distance, uh, we hope that it is not just coming from the same distribution. They are in fact very, they have very imperceptible changes with respect to one another. So uh, for instance, you may have two cats, very different cats, and they'll have very different perceptual distances. And in fact, we do want them to have very percept different perceptual distances. Here, we want to capture imperceptible changes between X and X prime. Great. Um, and we have a question from Alex Roby, um, who asked, uh, I guess, a more high level question related to perceptual distances. So um, if uh, you consider the changes in, for example, the cheetah size, while it may not satisfy an LP norm constraints, uh, it seems that based on the examples you show that they are making minor edits to the image. And so uh, he was wondering if the perceptual distance goes far enough towards the true notion of perceptual similarity. For example, would that attack allow us to change the image of a scene um, that was shot in daytime to the same scene at night? That's a fantastic point. Um, so, so the level of imperceptuality for each image actually can be different across different images. But here, uh, because this is like just the first step to put out this idea, we are using the same threshold of uh, imperceptuality of with respect to this neural perceptual distance across all of these training samples that we have. So for some of, and we are basically picking this threshold in order to make sure that for uh, almost all of the samples, the adversarial examples that we'll have, they'll be imperceptible. But you're right, maybe you can have some more uh, sample specific thresholds uh, in order to have more interesting adversarial examples. And um, as I mentioned, this is a brand new work and I hope that a lot of uh, follow-up works uh, come out of this work. And I think all of these are very interesting directions that you're, you guys are mentioning. Great, um, and I do also have another question. Um, so in your talk, you alluded to sort of, um, you know, this adversarial robustness of the perceptual distance metric itself. Um, I was wondering if you can talk more about that and whether there is a way of formalizing adversarial attacks to the distance metric itself. Uh, can you repeat your question? Adversarial robustness with respect to? The, the, the perceptual distance metric. Right, um, right. So uh, this is a little bit of a more complicated question um, because as I mentioned here, especially during the training, this perceptual model can also be uh, adapted to that. So uh, 
in order to have a certification with respect to, to this thread model, we also need to deal with the non-convexity of the constraint that we did not have in the LP case. Uh, so I don't have further thoughts on that, so uh, more concrete thoughts on that, but that would be an interesting uh, area to think about to come up with some guarantees even for neural perceptual threat model that we are introducing here. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we have uh, another question from Ami Reza Shari. Um, and the question is because the inner optimization you're doing with respect to the inputs uh, is only self approximately, can we come up with a stronger attack using a better optimization methods? Uh, so, for example, for the LP case, um, provided, uh, right, for the LP case, because it's convex. Uh, you know, we are able to solve the inner loop, but then obviously in the non-convex problem, we may not be able to actually find the other one. The answer is yes, I'm sure, uh, you know, people can come up with stronger uh, attacks. As I mentioned, we have two attacks, PPGD and LPA, and LPA by itself is a really, really strong attack. And I, uh, I think even though it is possible to come up with even a stronger attack than LPA, uh, but even with current defenses, LPA reduces their performance almost 0%. So um, in, in that case, we perhaps need to think a little bit about uh, robustifying the defenses against LPA attack and then think about uh, computing this optimization in a stronger way to have stronger attacks. So I see one question about the paper link. As I mentioned, I, we posted the paper on archive last night. So I don't think it will appear today, probably by tomorrow it will be out. So I'll post it on my Twitter and I'll also send the link uh, to care to share for with other folks. Uh, but you can also contact me and I can share the draft of the paper with you if you're interested. Hey, so Hale, I have a, just one question. Um, so with your new form of retraining, I noticed that the clean accuracy drops more than compared to like training with L-Infinity or L2. Do you have a comment on why that is the case? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, we, have, we see a drop in the clean accuracy. Uh, when we have uh, generalization against many other types of attacks, and maybe this is an intrinsic uh, trade-off that we need to pay in order to gain from ro having robustness against 12 different types of attacks. So this is something that we are also uh, studying at the moment. Great. Are there any other questions? Uh, hi. OK, so we do hi. have so, I have a question. Uh, as well, it was hi. a really great talk. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so uh, can you comment something on the data complexity or no number of data points that you need to train LPA or to train PAC? Uh, compared to L2 or L infinity distance uh, adversaries? Right, so I, uh, I don't exactly remember how many samples that we have, but basically we use the same number of samples in adversarial training against the, you know, this perceptual distance versus the spatial transformation, the color add, and the same for other LP attacks. So I don't think the number of training samples would be a bottleneck for training path. But yeah, but uh, you have this line of work where they say that you require more number of data samples. If you want to maintain, uh, you know, uh, uh, accuracy, uh, clean accuracy, and, uh, uh, and getting the same adversary accuracy, right? So don't you think that you, uh, probably PAC might be requiring more data samples to get back clean accuracy compared to n 2 infinity distance adversaries? Uh, that's very possible, in fact. So that's an interesting uh, thing to look at to see uh, would we increase or clean accuracy if we had more cleaning samples. That's a very good point. And if you don't mind, please share your work with me and we'll definitely take a look into that work. Oh, sorry, it's not my work. Uh, I was referring to works, different works in the literature. I see, uh, yeah. but yeah, whatever work that is, just share with me just to make sure that we, uh, we have that in the North uh, okay, sure. link. Thank you. 
All right, any other questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, that concludes today's seminar. Thanks again to Sohail for the great talk. Thank you, guys.